We are uh, excited to have Dr. Karen Dannemiller here today uh, to wrap up our Science in Action seminar series for this semester. Dr. Dana Miller directs the Indoor Environmental Quality Research Group, which addresses concerns within the built environment, and her work aims to improve the understanding of chemical and microbial processes indoors that impact health and especially childhood asthma. She is an associate professor at The Ohio State University with a joint appointment in civil, environmental, and geodetic engineering and environmental health sciences. She also has a courtesy appointment in microbiology and is a core faculty member of the Sustainability Institute. She has recent awards, which include the National Science Foundation Career Award, the Buckeye Engineering Women, Women in Executive Leadership uh, Innovation Award, and the Lumley Engineering Research Award, and selection in the American Academy of Environmental Engineers and Scientists, 2022 40 Under 40. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll let uh, Dr. Dana Miller take it away, and thank you again. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for, for having me today. I'm really excited to be here. Um, we have a relatively small group, so I'd love to have this be kind of like an informal conversation. Feel free to just jump in anytime with questions. Um, I have maybe about half the time in slides, so um, definitely lots of room to, you know, have discussion on any anything of interest. Um, and many of you here were actually involved in this work, so, you know, feel free to to jump in with anything as well. Um, so as Vanessa said, I direct the Indoor Environmental Quality Research Group. So we, this is kind of how I think about much of what I do, is the interaction between the indoor environment, chemicals, and microbes, and how those ultimately impact human exposure. Since then, we started to look at some other cool things as well. So how the microbes in the indoor environment, what they can tell us about um, what's actually going on in those indoor spaces. Uh, so the work I'm going to uh, focus on today is about using what we know about the indoor environment to develop new monitoring techniques specifically related to viral disease. I'm going to talk a little bit about our work in space at the end as well. Um, so I'll get I'll get to that as well, but looking at microbes on the International Space Station. So two very different topics, um, but both lots of fun. Uh, so my talk today, part one is on the viral monitoring we've been doing. I'd say this is about 90% of the talk, plus or minus. Um, and then I want to make sure we have a little bit of time at the end uh, to talk about opportunities in space related to microbiome research. All right, so for the uh, COVID-19 monitoring project, uh, so when COVID-19 hit in 2020, we were sitting there as the, envir the Indoor Environmental Quality Research Group wondering how we could possibly contribute to everything that's going on. And uh, we had actually not done any viral work at this point so far. We were primarily a fungal lab. Uh, we had one time sequenced some viral material with Matt Sullivan, who's here. We actually never published it. We said, hey, that was cool. And then we kind of had moved on from it. And that was the extent of the viral work we had done uh, to that point. So, but we said there, there must be some way we contribute to the knowledge to help with everything that's going on. Um, so we took a look at wastewater monitoring work and we identified that it would be really helpful to have a long-term surveillance solution that could be applied more directly at the building scale. So if you think about this on kind of a continuum, we have wastewater monitor on the left, which you can easily monitor an entire sewer shed, a large population at relatively low monitoring cost and effort uh, per person, but you get sort of lower resolution data in terms of who um, might be infected. You can do that at the building scale as well, but there are particular challenges with that. On the other end of the spectrum is individual testing uh, for viral illness, which um, is everybody's favorite thing to do to go get tested every week. And it has a high monitoring cost and effort. You're uh, generally measuring, you know, about one person per time, unless you're pooling samples. Um, and people really don't like it. So we said, can we do something in the medium scale to look specifically at buildings and better understand the prevalence of a viral disease within a building, um, specifically uh, COVID-19 at the time? So we knew at the time that most of the uh, respiratory spread occurs indoors. So we think about where does the virus go? So here's this lovely picture of a sneeze that you've probably seen somewhere. And these are respiratory droplets that we exhale when we're breathing, coughing, sneezing, talking, whatever we're doing. And 
many of the small particles are actually going to stay in the air for a really long time. And those are probably more likely to be associated with transmission. But there's a wide range of particle sizes here. And those larger particles, where are they going to end up? they immediately fall to the floor. And they're gonna also be carrying a large amount of uh, viral nucleic acid in them as well. So thinking about that sort of gives us some clues about where we might look in a building if we wanna know if someone has been in that space who has been infected. Uh, so the viruses are um, actually present in a wide range of particle sizes. So this is to scale. On the left, you have a volatile organic compound, so something like formaldehyde, um, that you might smell. Uh, a viral particle is in the red and a droplet from breathing, coughing, sneezing, talking is in the blue on the right. And these you know, generally range from 0.1 to about 100 microns in diameter. The viruses, however, are not generally floating around alone like this. They're usually within those respiratory, th those larger respiratory droplets. So that can help us evaluate where this is actually going to end up. If you look at aerosol deposition, um, so on this graph, you have deposition velocity of aerosols on the y-axis and particle diameters on the x-axis. And this is on a log scale on both sides. Um, and so things with a lower deposition velocity stay in the air for a really long time. For the smaller particles, less than about 0.1 microns in diameter, uh, those tend to be removed from indoor spaces uh, through Brownian motion, electrostatic forces. They're very sticky. So they run into something, they stick there. Those end up on like the ceiling, the walls, and the floor. On the right-hand side, you end up with uh, larger particles that are usually removed through gravitational settling. Um, and so those a lot of times end up actually on the floor. If you look at where the respiratory droplets are, they kind of span that range um, where the smaller respiratory droplets are right around one micron in diameter. Uh, those particles are going to stay in the air for a really long time. They have the lowest deposition velocity. They tend to stay in the air forever, um, which is part of the reason that we get such efficient transmission, unfortunately, of a lot of these, these droplets uh, of, of these viruses. Um, but a lot of the other particles are going to be in these larger size ranges that are going to pretty rapidly settle out and end up largely on the floor. Um, another interesting fact is cat allergen also tends to be on particles that are about one micron in diameter. So if you measure cat allergen in homes that don't have a cat, you can actually usually find it um, in a lot of cases because the cat allergen just gets in the air and it, it just stays there um, and goes, goes everywhere. So unfortunate if you do have uh, cat allergies. Um, so I just want to note here that we're not really talking about viral transmission. We're talking about sort of where the virus goes, but viral transmission does occur by a lot of different routes. Um, this is mostly just focusing here on the aerosol route, and we won't go into that too much. Um, so when I think about the floor, I think a, a lot about uh, dust. So we held a workshop here at Ohio State in 2019. We almost pushed it off till 2020. So thankfully, we held it in 2019. Little did we know. Um, but we got, we invited about 40 people uh, who have interest in understanding how carpet impacts the indoor environment. So the question was sort of how does having a carpet in your home impact indoor microbiology, indoor chemistry? And one of the main findings of the carpet was that dust serves as this very important microbial reservoir. Um, and so we focused on carpet and dust. So not only does the floor material in your home uh, it can be resuspended and become a source for human exposure, but it's also a sink, and it's also where a lot of the material ends up in this dust. If you look through the literature, other viruses have been found at high levels in floor dust, So, and SARS-CoV-2 had already been detected on particulate matter. Um, so we said, what about dust in the home as a potential, a potential source to better be able to track COVID-19? Um, so we were really looking to develop a new longer term surveillance solution for use at the building scale. So again, this was kind of the overall goal of this project. So the goal was really to evaluate dust as a matrix for outbreak surveillance. Uh, so the first, uh, this was done in several stages. And one thing I want to talk about at this talk is actually the scale up that occurred uh, for this project, which is very rapid um, in terms of a research project. Um, so the first project that we did was actually looking at samples collected from rooms of students in isolation. 
on campus. And we evaluated for the building. We said, let's look at bulk dust, surface swabs, and passive samplers. So these were rooms on campus where everybody was positive. They were waiting out their isolation period. And we said, where can we find viral RNA uh, within these rooms to help potentially track it in other buildings? Um, so I want to emphasize here that RNA detection is very different from infectivity. Because we're detecting RNA, that does not mean anything about if the virus is infectious. Uh, so this is a little schematic of a viral particle. Um, so this, en this envelope virus, like SARS-CoV-2, has this uh, somewhat fragile envelope on the outside, um, a protein capsid on the inside and then on, in the middle, and then a nucleic acid, either RNA or DNA. Um, in the middle. And so what we were looking for here is the RNA that's right in the middle. It doesn't tell us anything about this outer envelope that's necessary for infectivity. So just like to emphasize the point, we were not measuring anything about infectivity um, in the dust. In fact, I had a proposal rejected without review because they said we don't consider infectivity in dust. And I said, that's not actually what I'm talking about um, at all. But this, um, I just want to emphasize that point here. So when we looked at these rooms on campus, um, I got the first email from my graduate student on a Friday afternoon in October of 2020 after running the first samples and she said, it's positive, we can detect it. We had no idea at this point, could we even detect viral RNA um, in these dust samples? And so when we looked at these isolation rooms on campus, we looked at the concentrations in uh, the floor dust as well as the surface swabs and the air samples. Our air samples were between 20 to 30% positive, depending on the method we used. The surface swabs were 55% positive, and the dust samples at the first pass were 89% positive. Um, here's the percentages over here. Uh, we actually rapidly got that up to about 97% positive, and at this point, um, I would say we're, we're probably approaching you know, much higher, even much higher detection limits than that or detection uh, percentage than that. Um, the concentration was also highest in the floor dust as well within these rooms. So it clearly pointed to floor dust as a great matrix to help monitor uh, for these viral exposures. Uh, we also looked at this over time. Uh, so we this was just RNA copies per milligram dust um, over different weeks. And when you collected the RNA in bags, if you just let the bag sit in the lab, the RNA doesn't really tend to degrade. It actually stays at the same level. This was actually shocking at the time because RNA is such a fragile molecule. Um, we were actually surprised to be able to detect it at all. And then really surprised we didn't see degradation over time. Um, we're thinking it's probably because it's protected into, in that protein capsid within the virus, um, but we don't know for sure. Um, we did also see some variability in these first measurements for this first study. Um, environmental health and safety would not let us sieve the dust at this point um, because of unknown risks. Um, so we did find more vi variability um, in it as well, um, but we have since developed a, a sieving protocol. Um, this detection was also despite the application of a disinfectant. So in these isolation rooms, when the students left the isolation rooms, the um, people cleaning the room would first spray this disinfectant on the room and let it sit for 20 minutes. Um, this is a non-selective oxidizer, um, but even despite application of this disinfectant, we were still able to detect um, the SARS-CoV-2 RNA in the dust samples. So uh, we published the first paper, we submitted it, I think it was right before the holidays in 2020, um, really an all hands on deck effort to get it out as quickly as we could. Um, and then in spring of 21, we started a pilot scale study. Um, this whole time is really the best analogy I have is building the plane as we fly it in terms of trying to get this scaled up as quickly as we could. Um, so we actually um, had our study highlighted in OSU News just about what was going on. So to make sure everybody was also aware um, as we were collecting these, um, these dust bags around campus, we had this awesome team of undergraduates working with the uh, building staff who have been absolutely fantastic. Um, they like to call themselves the Dusketeers. Um, so it was uh, a fun uh, a, a fun name that they, they made up. Um, and so for this first pilot scale, we collected dust samples from a small number of residential buildings and other buildings on campus. Um, and we had some first um, initial indications that 
uh, these detections were were fairly accurate. So this is from one of the residence halls, and this is a log scale on the y-axis. And you can see here in orange was uh, positive detections, and then uh, two different types of dust collections. The blue was a private room. So this was a vacuum that the students were able to optionally use. So it's stored in a closet. Students can go grab it to vacuum if they want, but they don't have to. So some students are gonna vacuum, some students won't. Um, and the gray is the samples collected by the custodial staff from the hallways and common areas. I mean, you can see, you know, this is not necessarily a robust comparison, but you could see some correlation for higher amounts of positivity um, in the individual testing data compared to what we were seeing in the dust sample um, for this residence hall. Um, the other thing that was really exciting um, is that the higher concentrations were actually sequenceable. So we were, and thanks to everybody at AMSOL who did some awesome work on this, um, that we were actually able to sequence the variants out of this. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that um, in a bit. So scaling this up, we had our first pilot data from the spring. We said, that's that's great. It's looking good. Things are working um, basically as we expected them to. Um, so uh, we went, what I'll call full scale at this point in August of 2021, where we were able to uh, collect samples from about 50 buildings a week, again, still building the plane as we fly it. Um, and we were able to uh, collect this data with, um, with AMSL processing the samples, which was fantastic, and provide the data to the university in conjunction with all the other measures that they were collecting to help keep everybody safe during this time. Uh, so this data was fantastic to have in conjunction with the wastewater data to look at correlations there, as well as any individual testing data we had at various time points to understand what was going on on campus. And then that could go into uh, decision-making um, as, as well. Um, so we collected some, uh, some really great data during this time. This is from the um, fall of 2021. Uh, samples, and you could see um, we're still working on um, consolidating this data, but you can see some of our detections here. Um, these are residence halls and then weeks across the top, and the the sort of darker red, you can see kind of like two waves, which correlated pretty well to known uh, cases that were also around. We had lower numbers at the very beginning of the semester, um, which we thought was probably because of pre-testing that a lot of those positive cases had tested before they came to campus and actually never made it into the residence hall when they first got here. They just went straight to the isolation rooms um, as well as what we think um, probably happened at the beginning. But the other red air, the other red kind of waves uh, correspond fairly well to what we knew was going on um, in the community at the time. Um, so there are some complicated um, issues going on in terms of the understanding the correlations within this data. So if you think about what was happening in the building, somebody becomes infected on a, a certain day, their viral shedding is going to increase at some point. Hopefully they get a positive test. You know, testing was frequent enough at, the, at this point um, that they receive a positive test and then they were removed into an isolation room. Um, so all of this viral shedding here in purple did not go into our building um, at the time. And then this is going to kind of shift around depending on the individual person um, and the situation. And then generally when they return, they may still be shedding viral RNA, even if they're no longer infectious. So you may have heard of people continuing to test positive for COVID-19 after they're no longer infectious. And so they're going to continue to shed that into the environment as well. Um, so it does complicate actually looking at some of these um, these associations, but we were um, we've been working with a fantastic uh, mathematics and statistics team to help understand how we could correlate this data uh, to the data we're seeing in the buildings. Um, so this is from a paper that's currently um, in prep where we have kind of modeled individual shedding patterns. This is uh, Joe Tien and Matt Washer um, and their group's work. Um, and they have actually created a, a pretty robust model of what that actually looks like and then how that can actually correspond to the amount in the dust. Um, so they kind of take all these like, you know, modeling all these different individual shining parameters, how much ends up in the environment and what you get out. Um, and then you can end up with a theoretical um, distribution of how much um, viral RNA corresponds to um, an individual 
Um, and of course, it's going to be highly variable. You uh, may have heard of super shutters. People are going to shed a very uh, variable amount into the environment. Um, I'd also note that the RNA data here are actually based on the alpha variant. Um, so the variant also changed how much people are shedding um, into the environment as well. Um, so you can then, but the benefit of this is you could take the RNA copies per milligram dust and then correlate it back to approximately how many people you think were in that space um, at a time. Um, the other exciting thing we can do with this is we can also track variants in a building. So this is the work of uh, John Van Dusen in collaboration with everybody um, at AMSL doing this really exciting sequencing work. Uh, so we took a subset of these samples and we sequenced the variant out of this. So this is one of the residence halls and you can actually see fairly clearly the shift um, from uh, Delta to Omicron that occurred around the holidays from 2021 to 2022. Um, and I really got to give a shout out here to Mike Sovic sitting right over there who has a fantastic um, a program that can actually help to assign um, some of the um, sequences to these, these particular variants. Um, this is uh, the variants in floors of a building. And so you can actually see we had one alpha sample way out here very early on, um, Delta kind of in the middle of 2021. And then you can see the shift to Omicron in early 2022. And you can actually, or, and you can actually um, see this in different floors, even of the same building um, as it occurred. Uh, we looked at this across campus as well. So across campus, the story is very clear. In addition that we have this kind of one alpha sample early, our Delta samples in the middle, and then the, sh the shift to Omicron shows up fairly well in the um, sequence uh, material too. This correlated uh, pretty well um, additionally with the known data from the community. Um, so here the darker lines are our dust data and then the dotted lines are the OSU surveillance data and the US weekly data um, on what variants were present. I think this red dot is actually in the wrong spot. I think it was um, was over there, but the you can actually see that you have a pretty nice correlation with a little bit of delay um, that may have occurred in some here due to the holidays um, where a lot of the students weren't back on campus until that shift um, to Omicron had actually uh, reoccurred. Um, but the nice thing is that this does mean that the dust data can potentially be used to track variants, especially in the absence of individual testing data to get a better idea of what variants are currently circulating um, in the population. Um, so again, what does this mean about the viability and dust on surfaces? Absolutely nothing. Just like to emphasize that here, um, it really tells you tells you nothing at all. Um, we can take some uh, guesses though about what's happening on these surfaces. So um, I did wanna also talk about some work. So this is work by uh, Nick Nastasi. Um, and we wanted to take a look at uh, some viral surrogates um, that may be representative of enveloped and non-enveloped viruses on different surfaces and flooring materials, just to get an idea of what could potentially be going on um, in these indoor spaces. So on this graph, um, we looked at two different types of carpet and actually dust as a material where we deposited um, viruses onto those materials and then studied decay over time. So this is um, both viability, and then in a minute, I'm gonna show you the RNA. So here we have two different viral surrogates that we looked at. MS2 is a non-envelope virus, so it doesn't have that fragile outer envelope. Phi6 is, um, does have that outer envelope. Both of these viruses only infect bacteria, so they were um, we were able to use them in our lab. Um, and you can actually see viability decay over time. Um, and the it decays much, more, much, much more quickly for Phi6, the enveloped virus. So this virus is more similar to SARS-CoV-2, is not the same, um, so there may still be other differences here, but it does look like on carpet and dust and flooring materials, it's gonna decay very quickly. And in fact, if you look at the dust data, the Phi-6 decay occurs quite quickly over just a couple hours um, in terms of the, the actual measurement for that enveloped virus. Um, the RNA though, hangs around for a very long time. So we see the same thing here that we saw in the prior data that in these same exact samples, the RNA uh, continues to persist um, 
and this was, you know, an hour's time period, even shorter than the weeks we measured before, but we really don't see a lot of decay um, that's measurable in the RNA um, over this time period. So this does emphasize again that if you're measuring RNA in these dust samples, it really doesn't tell you anything about viability because you don't have this time variable. If you look back um, on the viability, you don't know when in this time scale you are, um, even though you're still measuring uh, the RNA here. So this gives us some clues about what we might be looking at. Um, for this study, we also looked at different cleaning methods that you might be able to use to remove these viruses. Um, there was, uh, so the first, um, the first one is viability again, and then the second one is RNA persistence. And you can see uh, how much uh, concentration was left in these various samples. So untreated had these concentration values. Vacuuming and hot water extraction removed a little bit of both samples. Um, hot water extraction is actually what most people refer to as steam cleaning. So if someone says they had their carpet steamed clean, they, pro they didn't actually use steam. Um, here we did use steam as another option, um, but the hot water extraction actually didn't remove all that much virus. The steam cleaning did, but you're rarely actually going to use real steam in your carpet. And application of the disinfectant was also effective in decreasing the viability um, of these viruses. So this gives some information about how you might consider cleaning uh, the carpet or um, floors. And the interesting thing about this graph is there is a case study in the literature about this uh, concert that occurred. So this was a, a concert hall. Um, where the night before there was a, a concert, someone had, came with norovirus that was infected and they threw up on the floor. The virus was, the spill was not properly cleaned up. The next day, a large group of school children came for a field trip to the concert hall um, and were infected with the norovirus um, that that person had thrown upon before. And so it actually shows that norovirus does appear to be able to persist on these surfaces even if it's not cleaned. Norovirus, however, is a non-enveloped virus. It doesn't have that fragile outer envelope and people see it oftentimes persisting longer on surfaces. So it's gonna be more important to pick which cleaning method you're using if you're trying to get rid of something like norovirus um, that doesn't have that envelope necessary for um, infection. So it it's, one thing that we need to think about is when we are thinking about viability for any of these samples, is it an envelope virus? Is it a non-envelope virus? Um, again, this work is also done with viral surrogates, so there are some caveats there that it's not the actual virus. Um, so overall, we saw that dust can complement wastewater monitoring. Um, so the benefits of wastewater monitoring are that it has a larger small population and it can detect between one in 100 to 2 million individuals um, who might be positive. Um, the downsides though of wastewater is that it, uh, sample collection can be really difficult. Um, many of the buildings, for example, on OSU's campus were built over decades. And so it can be hard to determine exactly which um, buildings go into a particular catchment site, for instance. Um, you also usually need to remove a 250 pound manhole cover um, and the samples can be challenging. It requires some pre-concentration steps. And then this is a respiratory virus. So not everybody sheds virus in feces. So there are benefits and downsides to each of these methods. And I think the strongest thing is to actually use them in conjunction with each other um, at various times to get a mo the most comprehensive picture we can of viral disease within a population. Um, so all of them have pros and cons, but they're really overall very complementary in terms of what we do. So overall, I'd like to propose this as a new long-term surveillance solution that's kind of in a, the mid-scale range between wastewater monitoring and individual testing to help keep an idea um, about what is going on in a particular population um, with of any ongoing viral. So it's, um, it can definitely be problematic. We don't want a carpet anywhere that's gonna get damp or moldy. Um, and that is a huge problem. And then anybody who does have allergies and asthma, it's potentially beneficial to remove the carpet and for that dust exposure um, overall. Removing carpet in and of itself doesn't seem to have an impact on allergies and asthma, but if it's done in conjunction with like other 
interventions. Um, it can help reduce allergies and asthma. In terms of development, it will increase that exposure, but it's probably overall a negative um, in terms of the dust. And there's other things in the dust too. There's like traffic particulate matter that's that's come in and some chemical exposures as well. So overall reducing the dust exposure is good. And I think we just need to think about building like a healthy microbiome overall. But yeah, it's the the other thing to think about too is areas where a lot of viral exposure is going to occur. And so I think about um like daycares or places with small children. If you've ever had a small child in daycare, you're sick all the time, like that first year at least. And uh, it's, we don't know exactly how that transmission is occurring, but this does suggest potentially there are transmission differences in those spaces between enveloped and non-enveloped viruses that we might not be realizing where a lot of the envelope viruses probably are more aerosol transmission and the non-enveloped potentially both, like potentially it's fomites or, you know, like potentially a bunch of routes. So but yeah, very interesting. Yeah. So the, the viral uh, like infectivity goes down quickly, I guess, in the dust sample. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, if the um, viral infectivity goes goes down pretty quickly in the in the dust samples, how is it maintaining infectivity in the air? Um, over time? That is a great question. So if you think about, so if you think about where the virus is, let me go back to the beginning. It's, it's usually going to be in these droplets. And so there's actually pretty extensive um, research on how these droplets potentially maintain, oops, maintain that viral infectivity. So Lindsay Marr has at um, Virginia Tech has done a lot of really great work studying this as have others. And this droplet is not just water. So it contains proteins and other molecules that are in there. Um, it can grow or shrink in size depending on the relative humidity in the room um, and other things going on. So usually they're going to maintain infectivity because if they're enveloped within this environment that's relatively similar to probably what's in your mouth um, because that's this is basically a saliva molecule when it lands on a surface it's probably more likely to dry out um, or just have potentially have been there longer and so as soon as it dries out and this uh, particular um, uh, droplet is gone it's then going to destroy that envelope which is necessary for infectivity but yeah good question it looks like we have a question from the chat. Jonathan, do you want to unmute and go ahead? So um, I might have missed it, but I saw that you normalize your total to total dust weight. Do you think were there were there differences between the isolation rooms where dust could maybe accumulate at a different amount or rate than like buildings where there was movement? And like, could that affect virus detection, even though you're normalizing to the weight? And I, just a random fact, because I'm like helping an undergrad in my lab right now while I listen. And, and he had said that he was one of the people that collected some of the dust for experiments uh, uh, as part of the process. So I have somebody actually in my team that participated in your project adjacent, I think. So um, anyways, I just wanted to throw that out there. <laughs> well, first, thank you so much. I tremendously appreciate all the work for that went into collecting the dust samples. So, but yeah, that's an excellent question. So we did normalize to dust weight. Uh, so that's what we've typically done previously. So if we were doing a study on fungal um, contamination in an indoor environment, we would take the uh, spore equivalents, we'll call it per milligram dust. Um, so that I see as a pretty good indicator of like per that dust sample, what the exposure was, but there's a lot of variables there. So that is the milligram per milligram dust that was analyzed that went into the solution. We also have data on how much dust was collected in each bag. So all the bags have been weighed. Um, if you want to get a total measure per building. So there are a lot of assumptions going into this and it's actually something we actively want to learn more about is sort of what is the best normalization procedure uh, to get a good indicator of the viral concentration. So when we when we calculate out RNA uh, copies per milligram dust, uh, we find the best correlations in our data 
in terms of cases with the number of people in that building who were infected, not necessarily the percent, which is sort of interesting. Um, so like if you look at the number in that building, it better correlations than like, you know, it was 2% of people or whatever, whatever the number was. Um, but it's really the reason we normalize it per milligram dust is to just, we think that that is also some indicator of like how much dust was in the building, how many people were in there. But I think it's for sure something that we need to continue to look into. And um, if you have other ideas on normalization, it's something we're actively working on now. So like, I'd love to love to hear it um, for sure. It seems to correlate well enough with the case state at the moment, and then we we need to continue to improve on it as well. Let's see. And you also say, could you gather variety fitness data on dust? Does one variant succeed better than the other? That would be really interesting um, to look at. So you're saying um, if in terms of the sequencing, oh, variant, could you gather variant fitness data on dust? Um, I think it, it correlates pretty well with what's going in the population. But I think we one thing we're, we're going to go back and do is also look at there's a little bit of a lag in terms of what's going around in the population and what we're seeing in the dust variant data. And because the RNA does persist, it's in real buildings, the RNA does not seem to persist as well as it does in a vacuum bag. So if I like vacuum this room right now, and stuck it in the corner of my lab, that RNA would be very persistent. But if I then come back in two weeks and vacuum this room again, you could get very different data. And that's probably because there are just different mechanisms of how it's being destroyed. The, the fade and transport of RNA in the real environment is probably gonna be impacted by things like whoever's cleaning it, additional dust deposition, maybe UV light is destroying it, I don't know, but other things going on where the RNA does seem to decay in space um, somewhere between being cut in half and being cut to 10% um, each week as it as it decays in that real space. So we do see some of the, the RNA going away. Um, and that's a good thing because then if you monitor it over time, you might see a peak one week. And as long as it's continuing to go down, you know, things are probably more under control. But yeah, good question. Any other questions? Do we want to move to space? Do you want to move to we all right, let's move to talk about um uh, space. Okay, so um, I'm not going to talk too much about my like results um, from this project here where we've been looking at uh, dust from the International Space Station. Uh, I'd like to intent instead spend a little bit more time talking about upcoming opportunities on campus and maybe brainstorm a little bit about uh, ways to get involved. So um, very, very brief overview. Uh, this was from a project um, we did in collaboration. So uh, Ashley Bope and Nick Nastasi were the students working on this. This was collaboration with Mart Meyer from NASA and then John Horak here at OSU. And we looked at microbial growth um, in dust from International Space Station under simulated high moisture conditions. Um, and the thing about this project is I had never really seen my work as space relevant. Um, I actually got involved with this by presenting at a conference and um, meeting Marit there. And then she was like, hey, can you do what you're doing in the carpet samples from our dust? And I was like, that sounds awesome. Please send me some. Um, so it's it's pretty cool actually that, and I won't, I'm not gonna go into the details now, but if you look at the dust from the International Space Station and the dust from Holmes, they actually behave quite similarly. Um, there's subtle differences here um, that are really interesting and you know have a bigger story, but we, we were actually able to think about translating our research into space relevant results. And so I'd like to encourage anybody here, anybody listening to think about how the research might be relevant to space. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of exciting opportunities that are coming up. So we're actually transitioning now from a lot of the work in space being run by governments to more uh, commercial space era. And pretty soon we're going to have more humans than ever who are living and working in space with all the different missions that are coming up and all the different space stations. Uh, so a lot of this investment um, is actually occurring here at Ohio State, uh, which is which is fantastic. Uh, so Ohio State's going to be the new location for the George Washington Carver Space Park. Um, they're building a terrestrial analog facility out at the Ohio State Airport. Um, and this is going to be in conjunction uh, with Star Lab, which will be a um, a space station that is actually run by Voyager and uh, Nanorax. Uh, so this is just a little bit, yeah. No, go ahead. Yeah.
I believe so. Uh, yeah, I think, I think, I think that, I think, and they're, they're like associated. I think Nanorex is a subsidiary of Voyager. I'd have to go back. I'm going to double check for sure. But yeah, but they're, they're associated. So they're like the company behind all of it. And it's this um, really fantastic collaboration. Um, so this is kind of where, where it's actually going to go. So the initial um, acres are over here. The, I believe that the groundbreaking is going to occur sometime next year. And then it's uh, should be mo largely built by 2025 and then fully operational by about 2028. Um, so it's uh, definitely coming up as well. Um, and so in terms of everything going on, we do need a lot more research to be done to support this sort of shift in space that's occurring from the International Space Station to this wide range of commercial facilities. And for that to occur, we need a much more comprehensive understanding of particularly the microbiome in these environments. So I showed you the picture way at the beginning of my talk, which was of the um, the uh, panel on the inside of the International Space Station that had some fungal growth on it. Space stations have historically had trouble with microbial growth because they're this enclosed environment. You put people in there, we exhale moisture, we sweat, there's going to be moisture um, that needs to be removed. And a lot of that, if it builds up too much, can lead to microbial growth. When we built the International Space Station, we did a much better job understanding the, uh, how to control that moisture and relative humidity. Uh, but we need to continue to understand how that's going to play out in these new environments when we know it historically has been a challenge. I mean, these are, are very interesting environments where we still don't even completely understand the interplay about how the microbes are being transferred from the built environment itself between the plants and crops and anything up there, as well as the people, which are a huge source of microbes, as well as maybe any animals associated with experiments, um, things like that. And so this provides a wide range of opportunities uh, to get involved in this. Uh, so there was a, a really great workshop on this um, previously to think about what knowledge gaps exist and potentially understand these interactions. Um, we actually were able to put together a white paper um, that Nick Nastasi presented at IAC um, and think about what these interactions potentially look like, what, what the gaps are. And so there are, um, we also have some preliminary designs for what's going to be on the orbiting space station as well as available at the terrestrial analog facility. Um, so this is kind of an idea. So this um, this down here is kind of supposed to be like a, a plug and play bench. It looks, um, I got this image from John Horak. Um, so it kind of looks like a kid's toy almost, right? Like it's gonna be like the next hot holiday item. Um, and everybody's gonna want one, um, but it's actually gonna be what this floating bench is. And it has a lot of flexibility in terms of what you could design to put up there. So maybe you put, this is a QPCR machine or I, I, you know, I don't know. Um, but we do have specifications for what this is gonna look like. And then on the left, you can kind of see how these might actually be manufactured in space um, through like these uh, different printing technologies. So. There's a lot of opportunities to think about what should go in this if we want to be able to facilitate microbiome research. So thinking about what different tools do we need both on the ground and in the space station, because a lot of it is being planned and put together now. Um, so it's a really great chance to be involved um, early on in this. So now is a great time for user input. What requirements do we need to facilitate microbiome research in this space? Um, so there's some options for that. Um, you could, you know, potentially, we could potentially organize a white paper, a memo submission to Star Lab um, or John Horak, potentially hold a workshop. We've held some really great workshops on this in the past, or just, you know, more informally reach out and have coffee um, and talk about these things. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about sort of maybe not even necessarily to requirements yet, but kind of like how, what are some opportunities to come together as a group and think about what we would want as a community in terms of what the capabilities look like, both at the terrestrial analog facility and that are actually gonna go on uh, the space station as well. So I'll kind of open it up to see what, what others think. So I I don't know how you'd be able to do that. Or Jade. As someone who does sequencing, I don't know how you'd be able to actually like prep 
samples to sequence them in zero G because everything you do by hand, if you do this with a pipette, it's not going to necessarily go into a plate. It could just float away. So I'm not real sure how you'd be able to do that. I know they make machines now that can automatically prep these samples, but I don't, they're not very efficient at scale at least. Yeah. So that's a great question. And I, I think at this point, it's more about the dreaming and yeah. kind of like, and there are some ways to, that people have done those things. So there has been sequencing that occurred on the International Space Station with MinION. Um, and a lot of the sample prep, I'm, I don't know all of the details, but I believe they use a lot of like uh, microfluidics devices. And I think it's extremely challenging. You know, it's like we can just take a pipette and, you know, do what we need to do and be done. I think it takes a lot of like additional thought and planning. So some of these things are probably going to be things we do on the ground first and say, okay, what do we need to be able to do up there? Let's try it on the ground. Let's get our protocols all figured out. Um, and then we can translate it to what goes on the space station. Um, so I think it's a lot about thinking, what what is the next stage? What do we need to be able to learn? What do we need to be able to do um, in space? And then, you know, and then it's going to take a lot of that time and prep to actually be able to go to go and do that. But I think that's a really great question. Um, have you or anyone at Ohio State connected with DARPA on this and the Be Sure program that they came out with? I don't think so, no. Okay, so it's a, um, I don't know a ton about it, but it, they're, um, uh, uh, their program is on biomanufacturing in space. So, it, you know, could be a, a program to connect with or keep watch on. So, yeah, for sure. I think, I think that something like that would be great to connect with, with people who are already doing a lot of these things. And I think right now, um, if you want to send an experiment up to the International Space Station, so the experiments we did before, we were just getting stuff down, which was nice and easy, right? We didn't, if you want to send something up, it's like a years long intensive process. Um, there's a lot of requirements as well to make sure it's safe up there for the astronauts. So there are certain materials requirements and um, all these things that, that you have to go through to send something up. Um, the commercial uh, space environment is probably going to be able to facilitate some of that a little bit more with everything we've learned over the years in terms of stuff we were sending up to the international uh, space station as well, but it, it is very challenging to do that. And I, I think that some of figuring out ways to connect with maybe, pro I don't know much about that program, but maybe programs like that, that can help facilitate getting things up. So ideally we can spend more time thinking about what needs to happen than necessarily the methods of like, how do we do that? As long as we know it's possible or we think it should be possible. <laughs> Matt, can I cold call on you? Yeah. Yeah. So I think, and the question is sort of what, you know, what are people thinking about? What do people want to do? And I think it goes back to, this um, white paper submission to IAC, which this was a, a great way to talk to a lot of people on campus and see where the focus is and where the interest is related to microbiome research. There's a lot of interest in the plants and crops for sure. Um, and OSU has a lot of um, fantastic expertise and capabilities related to that. And that's gonna be a critical part, especially for any of these long duration missions as we try to go outside of low earth orbit, the plants are going to be a critical component of that, not just for food, but also for mental health of astronauts who love seeing the plants and the greenery up there because, you know, we can walk outside right now in this beautiful weather um, and they they can't do that. Um, I think some of it also related to, you know, general microbiome. I, of course, have interest in the built environment and what's going on, you know, keeping the space safe, preventing uh, degradation. Uh, up there as well. And then there's, there can also be interest in human performance. So how does, how does the microbial community of the spacecraft impact the people who need to, to live and work up there? Yeah. 
Um, I guess I'm just I'm wondering the new adoption learning program and that the discussion is that the product that has the new stuff. Um, but I was not sure if we sort of there are three or four projects that are already in place and the needs that people are already moving forward and thinking about funding. Yes, so so I think I think we're in the early stages of kind of figuring out who's going to be submit um, submitting these things. Um, we actually, um, in collaboration with uh, Jonathan Jacobs, who's on has some who's on have submitted one proposal uh, to look at kind of like microbiome, plant growth stuff, um, stuff like that. Um, working with the terrestrial analog facility, but I don't think there are many yet who are actually reaching out and in that submission stage. So I think the best thing for people to do is to think about their research program. Fundamentally, what do you want to do next? Like, what do you see as your next phase already? And then think a little bit, hey, how does that apply to space? Space is a really interesting environment because you really have to pare things down to like the absolute minimal thing that you really need a you know, whatever project you, you're working on to have, um, because you can't do a whole lot extra. So a lot of the technologies that we have today, like our cell phones, are because we had to miniaturize and really be creative in ways to remove excess stuff for the space program. Um, and then it ends up being helpful to, to us on earth as well. So a lot of the um, work that people are doing now is probably already applicable to this area. So this can be a really great funding source to think about for what you're what you're already doing and what you already see as the, like the next big research questions and then it can also facilitate a lot of the things that are going on in the near term future that are exciting. So I don't think there's a lot of active submissions yet, but there have been some. And so I think we're it, it's really a great time to kind of like build in this area and then probably build the capabilities around those of like what people really want to do. So there's two ways I think So, you know, team versus uh, group or team versus individual projects for new people getting into this, I think you can really pursue it either way. So um, the terrestrial analog facility is going to have some great, uh, great opportunities um, and great uh, equipment to use things like that. So there's already a working version out on West Campus that can be used even as the larger facilities being built. Um, for team projects, uh, the IAC paper was a really great way to get down on paper what a lot of people were already thinking about. So people, um, a lot of those conversations have started, but I think at this point, we just need a lot of drivers of people who are willing to say, hey, I wanna lead this project. I wanna get involved and push this forward. Um, and the IAC paper is probably a great place to start of thinking about what do we have? What are people interested in? So people involved in that paper were charged with writing two paragraphs. The first paragraph was, what do we know? And then the second paragraph is, what do we need to know next? And so you can kind of look at that paper for both of those options. And if you do look at that paper and you can't figure out who wrote which part, because now it's all together, let me know. And I can I can tell you kind of who contributed what pieces. So if you have a project idea and you need some extra pieces, you're looking to form a team, that's a nice place to start. Um, and, and you can do that. I think individual projects are also just fine too. So building off of that, are there any uh, workshops or working group meetings planned or scheduled or that is t TBD? I know that there are, are like at this point sort of thoughts about workshops that sort of I, we've we've had some workshops and I think we definitely need to continue having workshops. There's not any in the immediate um, near term future that are here. I know John Horak is always involved in a lot that he's actually holding around the world. Um, so he would be a great resource for somebody who wants to attend one um, because I'm sure he has upcoming workshops and things like that. But it probably is worthwhile to think about following up on the, the great workshops we've already had kind of specific to the state of Ohio um, and larger area and bringing everybody back together again to continue um, talking about it. Because I think a lot of really great connections were formed uh, during those workshops. So I hope they happen again. 
Um, it's, it's probably just a matter of getting everybody together, actually doing the planning, um, and, you know, continuing this push forward that hopefully eventually results in a lot of these like proposal and project submissions. Um, I also got to give a shout out in this to my student, uh, Nick Nastasi, who is like really stepped up, I think, as like a leader in this area. So he's about to graduate um, it, with his PhD um, in one of these upcoming semesters. And he uh, he is really very connected to a lot of what's going on here um, in the space community. He was actually up in Cleveland earlier this week at the um, the uh, con the uh, space related conference up there. I unfortunately had a conflict and couldn't make it. Um, but he actually knows a lot of a lot of these people as well and has a good idea of of these connections. All right, other questions, comments? All right, um, I think I will wrap up. Um, so the two big things to talk about today are really building out. Um, this new capability to use dust for modern your viral disease in conjunction with AMSOL. So um, it's a really great story of how we were able to build out um, from this initial idea, this first positive qPCR test, basically, um, the capability to provide this important data uh, to the university. And I hope to continue building this um, to, to broader scales with some of the um, proposals we've been submitting um, and continue to see how it can apply in other areas. And then we also talked about a lot of new opportunities for space relevant research, particularly related to microbiome. Um, and I'm excited to continue the conversations with everybody about how we can um, continue to be an active and engaged part of all the exciting things going on uh, related to space microbiome research. Uh, so I have a whole lot of people to thank for this work who've been actively involved in this. Of course, the funding foundations, um, as well as great collaborators and the students who are in the lab every day um, doing this. Um, and of course, everybody at uh, AMSOL who have been, you know, an integral part of everything going on. Uh, so with that, I'll um, take any more questions or you're, you can reach out. Awesome. Thanks, Karen. Really appreciate it. All right. Well, I think that concludes our Science in Action uh, seminar series for this semester. Thank you again, uh, Karen, for the, that great talk. And um, I'll hand it over to, to you, Heather. Thank you.